Good morning. Go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, where we'll be uh, spending our time this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1. All right, show of hands. How many of you had a chance to get outside and enjoy the beautiful weather yesterday? Yeah, a lot of us. Good. Um, at, the end of, at the end of the day, we spent our, uh, our afternoon mainly, um, uh, actually, we, we went for a hike at High Rocks, which is, I think, Bucks County's best kept secret, the beautiful, beautiful park of High Rocks. Um, shh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ralph Silver Park, it's about 10 miles that way. Um, not anymore. The, uh, um, so, yeah, so we went, we went, we enjoyed this great hike, and then in the afternoon, uh, it's mulching season, right? So we went out to the gardens and got, you know, the whole family was out there. We had work gloves on and we're uh, working up a sweat. And it was great. Just, it was great to be outside. And at the end of the, at the end of the day, at the end of any warm day in the Buchek house, we go to get ice cream or we, we go inside and get ice cream. So we're, we're heading off to get ice cream and um, our kids say, let's go swimming. And we thought, man, this is, like, this is great. The summer's already, like, summer is here. In their mind, we're ready. Let's, let's dive in. Somebody's got to have a pool open. Let's go swimming. Um, and it brought me, you know, it, just, it brought me back to, to summertime. How many, how many of you have been, how many of you have ever been standing on a shore on the, you know, at the beach, just standing there, kind of minding your own business and have totally been. Yeah. Am I, I guess only this side lives. <laughs> that side just doesn't get out very often, I guess. So. Um, <laughs> no, or you're, or you're not, a, not awake yet. Um, so I, that was me a bunch when I was a kid. I would, you know, I don't know what it was, whether I was just like fascinated by the shells that were being washed over or I was talking to my, one of my siblings or something, but I can't count how many times I'd be just standing there and, and my family would go, we would go down to, to North Carolina to the Outer Banks uh, on vacation every couple, you know, every few years or so. And, uh, and I'd be, you know, I'd be standing in the waves, enjoying the waves, and all of a sudden this big one would come, and I just wouldn't see it coming. And so, sure enough, I get nailed by this thing, and you have liquid sandpaper shoved up your nose, and like, you know, your face is just peeling on the, on the beach. It's the most awful feeling in the world, right? And then you, you get up, and you've got that salt water, like, sh you know, into your cavities of your head. Awful, right? But that was me a lot, I felt like, when I was, when I was little. And then um, one year when we were down on vacation, we bought boogie boards, which I thought, that's it. That's, this is the answer, right? So if I, if I can get this boogie board into the water, I can float, we could float on top of the waves and not get hit by the waves, and we could ride the waves in. I was really looking forward to, to boogie boarding. Well, my first time out with a boogie board, I, I took this thing, and I marched into the ocean with my boogie board right in front of me, shielding me from the waves, so I thought, right, right, you're laughing already. You know there's this going. So I, so I, so I walked straight into the ocean with my, with my boogie board flat out like a shield, blocking the waves. And of course, what happens? The next wave comes. It wasn't even a big wave. It didn't have to be a big wave. The next wave came, hit the underbelly of my boogie board, and just and launched me further and, and harder than I had ever been tumbled before. Launched me back. And now I've got this boogie board that's strapped to my wrist, dragging me along through the waves as well. The way that, the way that Peter and the way that James and the way that the Bible talks about suffering is not what a lot of our culture anticipates when they think of how the, you know, like, like, like how religion and how God, how spirituality speaks about suffering and refers to suffering and, and prepares people for suffering. A lot of people tend to think like, listen, you know, what, if you're going to, once you come to know Christ, once you place your faith in God, then you are going to rise above it. And, and God's going to give you the tools. He's going to equip you with everything you need to, to stand strong in the face of all these. And you're going to stand victorious and you're going to rise above. And there's, there, there are some some semblance of truth to that, that we will stand victorious. We will come out, so to speak, on top in certain ways. But, but when we hear that, when the human heart hears that, and when we start to try to synthesize that with our experience, we tend to think, okay, if I, if I get to know the Lord, if I spend time in his word, if I am growing in my faith, then I'm going to, I'm going to be like that boogie board. I'm going to, I'm going to have that tool to, to get up over top and somehow to be like miraculously untouched and unscathed by anything difficult. 
And that's not at all what the Bible does. When you, when you take time to study God's word, the Bible likens suffering almost, you know, kind of like these waves where it's not, suffering is not an if thing. It's a when thing in scripture. Always, right? And there's nothing that is going to remove you from suffering except for death itself, the final act of suffering for human life. When we pass from this life into the next, we will face trials. We will face really difficult, difficult things. And it's, it's not an if thing. It's a when thing. Some of you are go- some of you in our congregation, some of you in this room are going through some incredibly difficult things right now where you are, like you're, you're feeling at, at, uh, at points, you feel like you're stretched so thin. You feel like you are just about broken. Some of you feel very broken because of the way, because of what the Lord has allowed you through right now. Life is hard. Your days are long. You know, some of you just want, you just want to stay in bed in the morning. Some of you don't even look forward to going to sleep at night because you know I'm going to lay in bed and my mind is just going to tool away and torture me. And, and, and I can't even control the things that are going on. I'm just laying there and I'm feeling helpless and, and powerless to control or to affect anything. And, and you, so you know this very acutely. And if, you, if you're not there now, you have been in the past. And you, if, you have, if you haven't been in the past, you're not there now, it's coming in the future. Because this is life. It's not an if thing. It's a when thing. And Peter's words in this passage are, are pretty stunning. The way he approaches. So last week we looked at this idea of being elect exiles. Those who are, are we acknowledge, we're strangers, right? We don't, ha- we don't feel at home. There's this angst that we are wrestling through because something, you know, like it's not quite right. This is not, we don't feel quite comfortable. The more, the more we l- learn and recognize our citizenship in heaven, the more foreign this life feels at times. And yet we're elect. We are chosen. We are foreknown by God, he says. Sanctified, like set apart by God, by the Holy Spirit. Sprinkled by the blood, like marked by the covenant. That we are sealed in Christ, right? All, all these things he says in verse 1 that we looked at last week. And so, so there's this tension. There's this balance of we're total strangers we're totally, like, we feel like we're out there. And yet, at the same time, we're elect. We are brought in. And we feel completely secure. And, and we walk this tension. And then and Peter starts to um, kind of pull open what this means to, to live with this angst as Christ followers. But he does it in a really stunning way. So let's look at First Peter chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 3 through 12. Today, First uh, Peter one verses three through twelve. If you're using your pew Bible, by the way, that's on page ten fourteen, First Peter chapter one. He says, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled." And unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving 
They were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. All right, so let's pause there. This is our passage for this morning. Now, something you need to notice about this passage, there are no commandments. If you look through verses 3 through 12, actually verses 1 through 12, there are no commandments in the first 12 verses of this letter. No demands, no requirements, no directions or instructions. Here's the key. Peter is not telling you here what to do. He's telling you what to enjoy. And you have to catch that. These words, if you notice, do you notice how he starts off this section of verse 3? He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a classic construct in biblical literature. They would call this a, a doxology. Blessed be God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and doxology, the word itself, literally means doxa in Greek means glory. And logos means words. So these are words of praise, words of ascribing glory to God. And saying he's worthy of this glory. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he continues, and this is all... In the, in the Greek, it's, it's apparent that this may all be one entire sentence. This entire thing is one sentence. It's this one gushing prayer of praise. And so, and so what we're going to do, the way we're going to spend our time this week and next week, we're going to look at six, these six reasons that Peter gives us to rejoice through suffering. Right? Six reasons that he's going to give us to rejoice through suffering. We're going to break this down and just follow his lead and, and let him... Kind of, kind of march through all of these, these beautiful and, and unfold these beautiful ideas as to why we can rejoice as Christ followers, why we can rejoice through suffering. And I want to use that, that preposition, through, on purpose. You have to note, like, this is, this is not in spite of suffering, right? This is not defiantly in the face of suffering. Kelly had a, has a good friend. Her name is Abby. And, and when, uh, when we were in college, Abby had this little phrase. We would, like, we would tease one another. Or we would make fun, fun of one another. And Abby had this phrase where, I don't know where she picked this up, but she would say, like, we would tease her, and she would just go, ha, no effect. And, and she would, like, she would just bark this back. Like, we were trying to get at her, and she'd be, she would just sit there stone cold, ha, no effect. Like, sometimes when we, when we think of, okay, what, is, what does Christianity do for me in the face of suffering? What is Christ, what is my faith, what role does that play for me in the face of suffering? We tend to think like that. Well, like, if, I, if I handle this right, I'm going to be disaffected. I'm going to be unaffected. I'll be unscathed by suffering. And that's not what Peter does. He doesn't say that. No, in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're going to be able to stand and say, ha, no effect. Right? This is not this defiant, shake your fist in the face of suffering kind of approach. He is saying, this hurts right? This hurts. This stinks. Yet will I rejoice. I think of Job's words where he says, though you slay me, though he slay me, still I will hope in him, right? That's, that's the, the, the balance of the Christian walk is this hurts. This stings. I hate this in the sense, right? And I, and I should. There's nothing about this that I should that I should actually love this or want for this. Because that would be twisted. That would be an un, like an immature, undeveloped, underdeveloped approach to suffering. It hurts. We recognize that. And the Christian faith recognizes that. This is not how it's supposed to be. We messed the world up when we rebelled against God. Our first parents, when they rejected God and said, we're going to do this our own way. Sin and the results of sin and suffering entered into the world. And things broke. Everything broke. And now we have to deal with it. And it stinks. And the Christian faith just doesn't say, well, now you have the, the power to be, to rise above it and be unaffected. The Christian faith says, no, we're going to give you the perspective that's going to help you rejoice all the way through it. And that's what Peter's doing here. In verses 1 and 2, he talked about our unconditional position in God as his chosen ones, right? The Father, through the, the Father... He has foreknown us the whole, through the Holy Spirit. He sanctified us through Jesus Christ. He marked us by his blood for obedience to him. And now in verses 3 through 12, he draws out these incomparable gifts that we have in relationship with 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you're going to see him draw this out. So the first reason Peter gives us to rejoice, the very first reason, and I'm sorry, I don't have these on the board for you, uh, on the notes for you, so I will just write these down in your notes. The first reason out of six that we have is that we have a living hope. Number one, we have a living hope. And we see this in verse three. He says in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What does this mean to have a living hope? This is the only place in the entire Bible where hope is talked about like this, as as a living hope. And we see living stone you know, living waters. We, you know, we see other ideas of, of th- you know, inanimate objects that are otherwise alive and vibrant and, and as if they have life. This is the only place where we see this term living hope. It's not the only place that the Bible talks about being born again. And there's something related here that we should pay attention to. Um, born again, the first time that we see that is in John chapter 3. Actually, let me read this passage for you where these are, this is Jesus' teaching here. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of the time, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. So there's something sneaky going on here. You know, he's trying to get an audience with Christ uh, without being seen by others. He said to them, he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Come from God. For no one can do the things that you do. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a, how can a man, in other words, a full-grown man, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And so Jesus, he he starts to explain this idea that we see all throughout Scripture after this then, of this idea of being, being born again, being born a second time. And those of you who have experienced this, you know exactly what this means. Because while we've been born in the flesh, right, we have a, we have a physical body. Every one of us has, has been born physically. Our spirit is, is dead, right? We have, our spirit is it's not just dormant sleeping. It's dead. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, regenerating work of God's Holy Spirit in our lives, we become alive. We are born again in a, and we would say even in an even more powerful way than being born physically more miraculous more it's, it, and because we are born not just now we are not just alive physically but now we are alive spiritually and when Jesus says uh, born of water and of the spirit water is it's probably not talking about birth water right it's not talking about baptism water even but water being meaning being cleansed by God so like even ceremonially, you think of water in the Old Testament being cleansed and marked and considered clean by God. You're born of the water and born of the Spirit, born of the Holy Spirit. And your spirit becomes alive for the first time. And this, he says, you have to catch this. He says, he, this is God, has caused us to be born again. This is God's election at work. We talked about this last week. This is God's power at work in you. It's his work, his cause, his initiating work. But there's, there's, so that's what it means to be born again. But there's, there's more to this than that, right? So this idea of hope, living hope, what is he talking about? This idea of hope, it's not just hope that we're like looking forward to something or leaning forward and, and anticipating something. That's how the world views hope, yearning for someone that you're not sure of or, or yearning for something that you're not sure of. It's kind of like it's, it's, a, it's like a wish. I hope I get a raise. I hope I can get married someday. I hope Shane Filer stops making fun of me. Right? Just, just wishful thinking. Right? This is a really, this is a really difficult, this is a difficult concept for a, a Western mind to wrap its 
wrap its mind around because we don't tend to think in hopes in, in these terms. We think of hope as this nebulous, out there, someday maybe thing. Like it's just wishful thinking. For the Christian, our hope is something that is, it's fixed. So imagine two people on the end of a pier. Both of them have skis attached to their feet, and they have ropes in their hands that are stretching out over the water in front of them. Right? And, they, and they, they want to get out there on the water. One of them, at the end of their line, is this huge kite, this parachute, right? A sail, a foil. And they're, they're waiting for this gust of wind to come along, and they hope for that gust of wind to come along because they hope to go water skiing. One of them, the other one, at the end of their line is a boat that's already on the move. And, and their line is, the, the slack of their line is pulling up out of the water, and they see it coming. And they're poised and they're ready. And, they're, and they're, their hope, the, the one's hope versus the other's hope is so much different because one of them has a hope that is fixed. One of them has a hope that is going somewhere. Not just, and not, not fixed to a rope, not fixed to this object, but, but it's, it's fixed to something successfully moving. Right? And a Christian has a fixed hope. And the reason our hope is a hope that is fixed is because our hope is not in a possibility. Our hope is in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ, who conquered death for your sake, who has is, who is paved that way and successfully won that battle. And you know, now, now you can know with confidence, that war is already over. That battle is already won. And, and our, we, we wait in anticipation, and we wait in hope, and that hope is fixed. I think of 1 Corinthians 15, 17, where it says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all die, so as in Christ shall all be made alive. Paul was, Paul was even wrestling with this himself and saying, you have to understand, if you, don't, if you don't quite get this hope, then your faith starts to unravel. This is our hope. Christ has been raised and this is a done deal. In 2011, the New York Post ran an article on a man named Eugene Lang. Mr. Lang was a graduate of East Harlem's uh, PS-121. It's a, a, an elementary school. And had gone on to become a successful businessman. He was asked to speak to a class of 59 sixth graders. Just to the sixth graders. And he was confounded about what he could possibly say and genuinely to, like, to affect the lives of these young men and women, to give them some kind of hope. So he, apparently, he had, he had spent an all-nighter the night before just trying to figure out, what could I possibly say? What could I do for this class to change the trajectory of their lives? And so he, he scrapped his notes. He, was, he, was, he brought his notes to, the, to this chapel, to this gathering, and he started speaking a little bit. He got about five minutes in. He saw the kids kind of doing their thing, like, yeah, we've, we've heard this all before. He scraps his notes, and he speaks from his heart, and he makes this impulse statement, and he says, it was like listening to his own mouth when he spoke these words. He said these words. He said, stay in school, graduate, and I personally will pay for each one of your college educations, which is pretty, that's a pretty huge claim. And he says, right now, he says, I want to ask for one of the teachers to write down the names of everybody in this room, and I want to keep this list on me. And I want to set a reminder. So when you graduate, the year you graduate, if you get into college, I will pay your college tuition. And at that moment, the trajectory of these students changed. Right? That, that had, they had a hope now that changed the way that they lived, even day to day, the way they approached their homework, the way they approached that boring math class or whatever, you know, whatever it is that they just loathed before, something systemic, something fundamentally changed about the way they approached their life because of this hope that they now had. This man who they knew was capable of doing this thing for them. And they, they fixed their hope on that, right? Now, now, even there, you could say, well, you know, we didn't, we, we wouldn't know, would he, would he pull through on his promise? Or would he even be alive when they, we didn't, you know, we didn't know that. So there's still some element of worldly hope in that. We get that. But they had this fixed hope that affected the way they lived 
day to day. You and I have a fixed hope. When you let this affect the core of who you are, it changes the way you live. It changes the way you face suffering. It changes the way you prepare. Think of the way the, the hope of the resurrection affected Christians in the first century. Think about the way that this even, that this proves the resurrection, right? Think about this. Historians uh, like William Lane Craig, J.P. Moreland, Gary Habermas, and others have done an especially good job of kind of detailing this evidence. There are three ways that Christians in the first century were majorly different than other people. First, when the great epidemics hit, when they struck, uh, especially urban centers of the world, most people that had means to get out of the city got out of the city. And they would leave, and they would, they would flee, and they would go to safety, and they would get their families someplace safe. Christians not just stayed in the city, but Christians outside of the city would often move in to help take care of the sick. Because they knew, my hope is secure. I have nothing to lose. I have everything to gain. Let me go and see what I can do to serve some others and to possibly save some souls. It, it totally affected the way they lived. And others, like even the, the, the magistrates of the, of the day were writing back and forth to one another saying, what do we do with these people? We can't, like... The, our own, our own system isn't taking care of our people, our sick. But these, these they, they call them followers of Christus, is what they called them at the time. These people are making more of an impact, more of a difference than we could even keep up with. Second, when Christians were persecuted and put to death unjustly, they did not respond with violence. If it ever comes... If, if the day ever comes when we are met with persecution, with physical resistance, just, know, just prepare yourself now. We, as Christians, we do not respond with violence. Because we, don't, we are set. We are secure. Take this body, right? Fine. Take it. Right? They didn't respond with violence. They lived out the truth of the resurrection, the truth of the gospel, by not trying to—I mean, they could—, they could Fend for themselves legally as it was appropriate, but not violently. They absorbed it peaceably and prayed for forgiveness for those who were persecuting them. Third, because of the Pax Romana, for the first time ever, all national borders were open. All cities had multi-ethnic multi neighborhoods. And ethnicities were able to exist in the same physical location but nobody, nobody actually made that happen. Usually what would happen is cities, entire cities would have blocks of people that were given and designated for certain people groups. But when Christians came along, and as people came to know Christ, and as people came to understand, we we're all the same dirt at the foot of the cross. Right? As people started to understand, there is here neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, barbarian nor not. Like, those distinctions are gone. You're my brother. You're my sister. We're one in Christ. For the first time, a community started to arise that was genuinely multi-ethnic and loved it. And, and, and sure, they were met with, you know, it wasn't easy. They had, to, they had to bump through some really difficult things and adjustments. But it was the first time that the world had ever seen a community like that, that valued that kind of diversity and celebrated it, and was able to, ha they actually had the equipment to live that out, beautifully so. So why, why, what made them so different? It's because they had this fixed hope, right? They knew what happened. They knew that Jesus was raised from the dead. They knew that he had conquered death, and it was because of the resurrection that they could live, and th their lives could be so completely altered that they could live out the gospel in these ways. They had a fixed hope, and we have the same fixed hope. The second reason Peter points out in this passage, here in 1 Peter 1, the second reason Peter points out to, re to rejoice through suffering is that, number two, we have a guaranteed inheritance. So we have a living hope. Number two, we have a guaranteed inheritance. Look at verse 4, how he says this. It says, let me go back a little bit. He says, he has caused us to be born again, verse 4, to an inheritance 
that is, and look at these descriptors, that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So, so I mean, first, you could, that's just so encouraging, right from the first glance. We have an inheritance that's coming our way that is absolutely guaranteed. I had the privilege uh, to do a lot of traveling for a former job of mine. I was a recruiter. I worked in the admissions department at Moody Bible Institute, where I graduated and where Kelly graduated from. And every year, Moody would send me out on a college rep tour, like a college representative tour, where I get to go spend some time representing the school at college fairs that would, that would meet, where we'd get a bunch of colleges together, and everybody would set up tables or booths or whatever, and we'd just represent the school. Or in, in the in-between times, I would try to arrange to go and meet with and speak with different churches and schools to speak at chapels and other things like that. And, uh, and I, I loved it. I liked, I liked traveling. I enjoyed, I didn't enjoy being away from Kelly, but I enjoyed being on the road. And this one time, Kelly got to come, pardon me, got to come with me. We were married out in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon, and we, we honeymooned in the Pacific Northwest there. And so Moody was sending me to the Pacific Northwest, and uh, we saw it was a good, a good opportunity to, to travel together. We were really excited about that. And it worked out. Um, the, the, the trip was great. It was beautiful just driving around. We got to catch up with some friends and other alumni. Um, and on our very last night, after a great week, we got back to Portland to fly out to go to back to Chicago. And we showed up at our last hotel, 9.30 at night, exhausted from a day of speaking and traveling. I gave the guy at the counter my name and my credit card, right? And I waited while he did something on his computer and he kept asking me to spell my name like over and over again. Because, and I know my name's tricky, right? A boot check's not a, a typical name. But he kept asking me to spell my name. And then he asked me to give me his, my credit card like one more time. Just one more, let, me, let me run that just one more time. And I knew it was happening. And uh, he's, again, he's just pecking away at his computer. And then he stared through my chest like I just wasn't there for like a good awkward 10 seconds, just kind of stared. And I, and I said, just say it. And he says, we don't have you in our system. And I, so I, I went, I kind of rifled through my papers. I even, I pulled out my, because back then you had to print stuff, right? So I pulled out my, this printed Expedia confirmation number that I had gotten, that had been emailed to me. And so I gave him my my confirmation number, and he typed in the confirmation number. Still no good. You're, you're right. The, the, number that, the number that confirms that your reservation is reserved, that number I gave him, he, he typed it in. Still no good. So after calling 411 and a bunch of other hotels, do you remember 411? And we, we got a list of other hotels. We called up these other hotels in the area. We ended up staying in this creepy little, do you remember this? This chintzy flop house two blocks away. Um, by then it was like 11 p.m. by the time we had figured all this out. And uh, it, was, it was the most uncomfortable uh, night, the most uncomfortable stay. And we were probably in a part of the neighborhood that we, we just shouldn't have been uh, walking around in at that time of night. Um, because somehow our reservation had vanished. Christians will never be disappointed. They, this will never vanish. Our inheritance is secure. And it's not because God will pull through when it comes time. It's because he already has. Right? And this is like that fixed hope that we're talking about. This is not, this is not something that, like, you know, when, in the distance, when it comes time, he's going to get us there. This, is already, this has already been done. But push into this a little bit more. Why does Peter use these descriptors? They're not all saying the same thing. Imperishable, look at the verse. Imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Kept in heaven for you. Well, this word imperishable is a term that the Greeks would use to talk about something that had been unravaged by invaders, unspoiled, untouched by thieves. Like I think of um, Matthew 6 where Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Like it's that same idea of being, something being affected, something being ravaged. This word undefiled was used a lot in the Hebrew scriptures to talk about something that was ceremonially defiled or unclean, that would make that thing that, or that person unfit to come into the presence of God. And 
The Old Testament uses this word to refer to the, the, the land of Israel, the promised land. And when the people fell into sin, the land itself was considered defiled. And then this word unfading was used to refer to something that had just plain gotten old after a while. Not, not just physically fading, but it was literally, it was just, it was, it was old, it looked old, it f- but it felt old, and it wasn't exciting anymore. And you, you know how this is. I mean, in fact, just the other day, um, I was talking to Owen in our, uh, in, in our dining room. He was sitting across the table from me while we were eating, and um, we, a few weeks ago, we got these baby chicks, these adorable baby chicks. We got seven uh, chickens. We're going to raise these chickens and, and eat their eggs. <laughs> I don't know, sorry, I don't know where I'm going with that. But we, uh, we got these chicks, the kids, and, and Owen's sitting here, and he's like in this moment of, you know, he's, just, he's being this little drama drama guy that he, that, that he is at times. And in this, in this moment, he has this moment of like profundity, and he says, you know, when we first got these chicks, we were really excited. But now they're just chicks. And I know what he is saying. And, and, and Owen, he, he loves. I mean, in fact, he's got one of, the, one of the chicks is his. He named it Ginger. And he walks around with it around our house. He perches it on his shoulder. And he just walks around with this chick. And the chick's just kind of bobbing around, just doing its thing while he's walking around our house. He loves, he loves these chicks. But what he's, he, you, you know what he's saying, right? What he's saying is there is something, there is something different. So there's something different about the way I regard them now. My heart doesn't, like, flutter the same way it did when we first saw these little guys. These are the girls, actually. They're all girls. I, we hope they're all girls. <laughs> and he's saying it's, it's old, right? The, the, whatever that was has now faded, right? And when we look at this descriptor, it would be easy to look at this passage and say, well, of course, you know, he's talking about, he's talking about heaven, right? He's talking about heaven, of course. Of course, it's all these things. Of course, it's perfect. Of course, it's everlasting. But you can't, you can't move so fast on this. You have to remember, Peter is a Jewish believer. He's, he's a Jewish believer. His scriptures are the Hebrew scriptures. And you're going to see him quote so beautifully weave in Hebrew scripture all throughout the book of Peter. And his people are Jewish people. And when he says the word inheritance, when he says that word, and when he's conveying this idea of inheritance, it means something specific for the Jewish mind. And when you, when you think of the word inheritance throughout the Hebrew scriptures, your, your mind is cast to something specific. Israel, to Israel, their inheritance was the promised land. And over and over in scripture, we see this land referred to as their inheritance. And at one point, they're standing east of the Jordan River, just about to cross into the land. Numbers 32 records them some of them saying, you know, we're gonna, we will pass over, armed before the Lord, into the land of Canaan, into the possession of our inheritance. We've been yearning for this. We've been looking forward to this. We know this is it. This is what God has held out for us, right? This was their inheritance. And then after they conquered the land, God says something very sobering. And it's something that's repeated over and over again throughout the Old Testament. Joshua 23, after the conquest, Joshua 23 says, God says, Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. And you shall possess this land just as the Lord your God has promised you. And and listen to this warning. He says, Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of of these nations, to the people that were left and the, the gods that they worshipped and the value systems that they held on to, if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations, if you become more like the world, if you put your hope where the world puts its hope, if you start, start living life like the world lives life, right? Verse 13, he says, Know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. They shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes, and you will perish from off of this good ground that the Lord your God has given to you as an inheritance. So, in other words, this is yours, and it's yours to lose. 
Right? Love me, honor me, listen to me, and it will go well. If you reject me, do your own thing, you'll be on your own, and you'll lose it. You'll lose your inheritance. Now, take that and put it back into 1 Peter 1. What he's talking about is inheritance, and he knows this is this inheritance, and what he's doing, what he's setting this up, how he's setting this up. He's saying this inheritance is so like and yet so unlike Israel's inheritance, the inheritance that we formally understood. Theirs was physical. Theirs was fragile, and theirs was losable. Ours, and they, you know, they lost it, right? It was invaded, it was defiled, and we know that. And what we, what we now have is the ultimate inheritance that that promised land was pointing ahead to, right? And ours is eternal, and it's imperishable, and it's unlosable. And think about what that means. So when you, when you, when, he, when, when God told Israel, if you don't obey me, if you fall into sin, if you fall away from me, if you, if your eyes are not cast on me, you're going to lose this. Christian, think about this. You will never lose your inheritance. And that is just, that's unfathomable. Of all the things that we do to offend our Lord, to break trust with him, to, to push him away when we rebel against him, when we lose hope in him, when we openly walk in a different direction, you will never lose this inheritance. I think of Revelation 21, 3 through 5. It says, I, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place, right? That's, this is that promised land. The dwelling place of God is with man. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. It never gets old, right? It never gets boring. It never, gets, never, never sees pain. It never sees death. And the best of all, it's always with our loving God. And believers, you can rejoice right through the worst of life because you know this will never vanish. This is reserved in heaven for us, and it will never vanish. So the third reason, then, that he gives, the third reason that we can rejoice, he says we are being guarded by God himself. So number one, we have a living hope. Number two, we have this guaranteed inheritance. Number three, we are being guarded by God himself. And this is in verse 5 we find this. Being guarded by God himself. He says, For you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This is talking about that precious doctrine of eternal security. Or some, some have said, once saved, always saved. Or as the reformers used to say, if you have it, you will never lose it. If you lose it, you never had it to begin with. The present, this, this word that he uses, being guarded through faith, is this present tense participle that, that Peter uses to give this sense of being continually guarded. It's actually a military term that would refer to a garrison, something that, was, that would completely surround and protect a city that, was, that may have been under siege. Or even if it wasn't under siege, it was guarded, it was kept, and there was no way anybody would be able to get into this place. And, it, and he says, Peter says, this is how you are being guarded. You are, you are being that fought for, that cared for, that vigilantly protected. And by what? It's by, by God's power. Through your faith, that's the means that God uses, but by God's power. So, so we're, still, are, we're, we're still in this. We're still responsible, but it's by God's power. And I love Peter's heart in this. I love how pastoral he is in this, and how insightful he is in this moment. Because he knows, he knows that, he knows the human heart better than most people know the human heart. And he lived through seasons where he had every reason to, to question his own salvation, to question his own security. He, if you remember from last week, he openly rejected Jesus Christ and said, I don't know that man. I don't, I want nothing to do with that man. Right? If anybody should have been cast out and said, all right, you, you want to you you not know me? Fine. 
you don't know me. I don't know you. Right? If anybody should have lost, it, should, it would have been him. And, and he's saying, listen, you may know that Jesus is alive. You may know that you have a living hope. You may know that God promised to keep your inheritance imperishable in heaven. In other words, you know that God has, what, has God, what God has done for you in the past for you. And you know what God is going to do in the future for you. But what about now? What about the time in between new birth and our final salvation? What about these temptations and these pressures, the weariness and the persecution, the frustrations and the sufferings? What about the confusion and the fears and the, the traps that we face now? Does God say anything about that? Does he do anything about that? Does he, does he send his son to die for our sins, raise him from the dead to eternal life, cause us to be born again, and then just stand back and see if we're going to make it to heaven on our own? Is that how this works? Does he say, he, does he say listen, I did everything I could do. Now it's on you. You got to get there. You have everything you need to believe, to make good, cho good choices. Good luck. Is that, is, that how, is that what's going on here? Peter's not about to leave that question unanswered, right? And so he makes, this, he makes the answer very clear, very powerful in verse 5, when he says, you are, by God's power, you are being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Those who are born again, it literally says, you're continually being protected by the power of God, right? So I, I think of Ephesians 1, 14, where Paul says, you are, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Or I think of John chapter 10 where he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. They follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one can snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And again in John 6, we see Jesus stating that everyone that the Father gives to the Son will come to him and will, will raise all of them up on that last day. So, does this, does this mean that, that we do nothing? Like that, that God's got this? He's just he's going to carry us all the way through, and we, there's nothing for us to do? We just... We just Sit and enjoy it? Not, no. The answer is no. We are guarded. What does it say? Through what? We are guarded through faith. We've been sprinkled by the blood, verse 1 says, for obedience. Right? So for the first time, we actually have the motivation to obey. And we have the security to obey and to freely obey. And our hearts are humbled. Our hearts are grateful. And we want to honor the one who has given us these great gifts. But this is, this is God's work. He's the one who's doing the holding. He's the one who's doing the guarding. When, when someone says, think about this in application. When somebody says, man, I, I hope to get to heaven someday. In a, in a way that's not talking about this Christian hope that's fixed. And if you ask somebody, are you, know, are, are you saved? Are you going to heaven? And they say, well, I hope. And I, but I don't, you know, I don't quite know. If you're, a, if you're a Christian and that's how you view your salvation, that's not a mark of humility. That's actually an insult to God himself. Because you're saying, I'm not actually sure if God is capable of doing what he's promised to do to keep me safe. So when, when you say, I, I hope, or when you hear somebody say, I hope to get to heaven, you need to lovingly address that. Or if you yourself, if you have that view, I'm not sure. I don't know where I stand. Scripture wants you to have that assurance, wants you to have that confidence. But that confidence comes from knowing where you stand with Christ and having a good, healthy, and obedient relationship with the Lord. Sometimes we're faced with these crushing burdens, and it's easy to, to start questioning, God, are, like, are you out there? Do you love me? Did I do something to make you my enemy? Am I on the wrong side of this battle? Peter, Peter he knows what's going on. When he knows the, the, the human heart when it's pressured with suffering. And so he wants to apply this beautiful truth, this sweet 
truth, this doctrine that turns our questions off of our standing and onto our learning, off of our position and onto our progress, right? Where instead of asking, you're like, where, where am I at? You're asking, Lord, how can I grow? How can I understand you better? How can I know you better as a result of this suffering? How can I grow through this? What are you teaching me? Where are we going? So these are the first three of these six things that Peter gives us to rejoice in through suffering. So we have this living hope. We have this secure inheritance. And we are guarded by God's power, God himself. Next week we will pick up and look at these last three. Will you close in prayer with me? Father God, we we rejoice that we don't have to worry. We don't have to wonder if you're out there. We rejoice in the fact that this this battle has already been won. Our rest in that. And and we do. Lord, I pray that um, we would take fresh confidence in what it is that you're doing because we know that you're always at work. You're always doing something, even through the most difficult of times. And I, I, I pray that we would, you would discipline our hearts to look for that, to yearn for what it is that you're accomplishing in us as we face these difficult things in life. We ask this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.